Uh, Steve and uh, Alan are here. You guys just say hi to them. We're here because of them. You, you guys let us do this. I mean, I didn't mean that. You don't have to. Thank you. Everyone thank them. I don't expect you to I don't expect you to make nominal statements on this space. Brian, you do that. You, you get to. I'll try. I'll you, you, you will. Okay, so thank you for coming. This is um, another in Lava's ongoing series of talks in really amazing um, ceramic tile design spaces uh, with Brian Kaiser as our as our Virgil, our guy. Um, Brian. Oh, oh, perfect. Okay, go go get up there. Yeah, go get up there. Yeah, now is the time. So, so Brian is um, Brian is very gifted. Brian, uh, Brian lives in Rufus Keeler's house in Southgate, and I'm going to let Brian explain who Rufus Keeler is if you don't know who he is. I know that Rufus Keeler and Ernst Chelder are uh, not the same person, but uh, <laughs> but I think I think if you explain to them why you live in Rufus Keeler's home, they'll understand why you are really incredibly informed historian on Southern California ceramic tile design in its halcyon period, which is really uh, right after World War One through 1934, basically. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, this is a really great lobby. I I, don't, I, I want to stop talking. I just I want to thank everyone for coming. Take a flyer. Keep informed. Get on our mailing list. We, we try to do lots of fun stuff. I have a Charles Bukowski literary slot at the end of next month, the end of October, and that's in the flyer for Los Angeles. So that's going to be a lot of fun, and that's the next big thing we're doing. So Gordon, you're coming, I think. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Good. Okay. So Brian, thank you everyone for coming. Brian, take it away. Okay. Well, just quickly, uh, again, who I am, sort of why I wound up here is that uh, my name is Brian Kaiser, and uh, 26 years ago I bought the home of Rufus Keeler. Rufus Keeler was the founder and manager and the sole ceramist of the Mallet of Potteries, the Calico Potteries in Southgate, and a, a small but very successful pottery in Burden called Southern California Clay Products. We're not too far from uh, Los Angeles uh, City Hall, and there are 32 custom panels that Rufus was made for that, including the, uh, the council chamber and the, uh, the main lounge you come in with all the credits of whoever was mayor and council member and all of that. So uh, the rest of that building is back in the bean, but the custom tile <coughs> was all made by Rufus over there. So uh, considered by many to be possibly the finest ceramic uh, artist in California during that period. And uh, his home was Spanish colonial, but also largely uh, ancient Mayan, which was very popular at the time. A lot of ancient Mayan that went out of style has been destroyed. Anyhow, that started me on a whole quest of discovering what he did, and then you start branching out into other uh, manufacturers, of which Pat Chalder, of course, was working very close to the same years. And uh, it became one of the largest and one of the most successful tile manufacturers in the, uh, in the country. <clears throat> what I kind of like to do, however, is have a lot of you been in the chocolate shop, the Dutch chocolate yeah, shop? Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, well, I'll certainly, you know, I, I certainly am going to be talking about uh, Pat Chalder, but you know what? The Roebling family, this is John A. Roebling and Sons Company building, which they constructed in 1913. Architects were Hudson and Munsell. Cost about $120,000 to build. And the, this is one of those great, great little spaces because it really combines some astounding history of an amazing family and uh, some amazing experiences in American history. And then we wind up here in, in California in 1913 with their special tile. So actually, I'm going to do quite a bit on the Rollings because this is, this was their building. And that's um, one of the most important things to start with. And then we'll sort of zero in on the tile. Um, this is one of those astounding uh, German immigrant uh, families coming to the United States in the early 1800s and just having an amazing effect on this country and actually in the end of the entire world. Johann August Grimling, Carl Ulam, the LIMG, was born in Mulhausen in the Kingdom of Prussia in 1806. And to give you a little idea of the context in which he lived, which is somewhat ironic that this is true, Mulhausen is very, very close to the little village called Jena. It was the Battle of Jena in 1806, the year he was born, that Napoleon Bonaparte defeated the Prussian army and French troops occupied his country, occupied Prussia. 
And uh, ironically, once you started to go to school, once you knew management, you went very early. I mean, you didn't even, even wait until you were, you were older. You started studying amazing topics when you were really quite young. And um, the polio, although he wanted the little people to be educated, he did not want his enemies to be too well educated. So when he arrived in Russia, he closed down a lot of the, the gymnasiums, the, the German high schools. So fortunately for uh, for uh, Rumbling, because this might have taken a totally different direction, there was uh, one of the finest um, uh, mathematicians and engineers in Prussia was a, a Jewish professor who was thrown out of uh, his the Yale University and took students into his living room. And he was not going to be deterred from teaching the students who wanted to teach them. His name was, was Unger, Professor Unger. So when Robin was very young, very, very young, he begins to study with Unger, demonstrates an incredible proclivity for mathematics and engineering and things like that. On his recommendation, he goes to the Berlin Academy in the capital where he studies. At the age of 15, at the age of 15, he starts studying. In little things, you know, like engineering, uh, painting, architecture, um, you know, all sorts of all sorts of mathematics, you know, higher mathematics. And he threw in a little bit of uh, Georg uh, Friedrich Hegel, the German philosopher, who predates Marx, was there. And uh, so he actually took courses from Hegel. Uh, you know, progression and elevation in that kind of society was very difficult, which is why many Americans left. And he was also very interesting. Once he studied under Hegel, there's a whole bunch of utopians, quote unquote, who came here at that time to quite create these idyllic sort of communist societies. This predates, this predates uh, Marx. So he must have had some money. I don't quite know where he got it. He came to Pennsylvania in 1831 and bought 1,500 acres and founded the city of Luxembourg, which is still there today. He was home, his original home was there. And after all this background in engineering and mathematics, he wanted to be a farmer. And he thought the part for returning to the land was the token ideal, which you return to the land, you, know, you, weren't, you weren't involved with all these, you know, this, this, you know, the mechanized world around you, what happened, which is astounding <laughs> how he walked out. So for five, so for five years, he walked behind the plow on a horse. And the community, like a lot of these communes, it didn't, it didn't go well, you know, it just did not go well. He was, he was a brilliant engineer and a terrible farmer. And, <laughs> and he's, got, he's got a degree from the Berlin Academy in engineering and, you know, British building. So he starts work work for the, um, the state of Pennsylvania while he lives in uh, Luxembourg, and he reads an article. and I love these people who have a, a genius like this. And wherever they see a problem, they want to find a solution to build a brain like this. So he reads an article about canal boats either in Pennsylvania or New York, which had to be taken out of the canals at some point and dragged over hills and mountains to get to the canal. On the other side, they were being dragged by ropes, hawsers, huge, you know, huge rope hawsers about this, about this thing. So what the article was saying, the ropes did the job, but they wore out. They were very, very, very expensive, and they wore out, you know, constantly. So what the men on the canal were complaining about, not the ability to do the job, but this was very expensive to do the job. Well, he instead wire rope, the creation of wire rope in Prussia. So he builds a little suspension walkway, not a bridge on his farm in Luxembourg, just a little thing, you know, whatever, three feet long or ten feet long, but it's a little suspension bridge. Mm -hmm. And he starts to realize he's got to create a way to really bind these wires together, steel wire together, and make it this strong and be able to make it of any size he wants to make it. He gets a package on that in P41 out of, out of Luxembourg. So the whole thing starts not with bridges. It starts with hauling the elbows over, over mountains. So it is to say, stop and think. Once somebody can create this, what can you use this for? You can use this for just about anything, everything you can imagine. And briefly, we'll do a little bit more specifics later. But if you look at all the tiles in this room, this is all custom-made tile, which is demonstrating uses and purposes of the steel wire rope, or the steel key, which he created. So um, we'll get to the more specific ones. But none of these tiles appear in the Bachelor catalog. These are all custom made, and we're obviously custom made for this room. And uh, whether the Roman Museum in Trenton says they are not aware that this tile was ever used anywhere else. So for all we know, these are absolutely custom made, one of a kind uh, tiles. Mm -hmm. so, um, so he's got the wire rope business going. 
And needless to say, the need for it just all of a sudden you have a product, now you have the business exploded. He goes to Trenton, New Jersey, where he builds his first factory. And while we're doing all of this, I'll pass this around. That's about as Prussian as you can get. <laughs> Go on. Why don't you pass that around? Around there. And then, well, I've got a couple here because I'll, I'll, I'll pass these around while I'm talking. I think this will be helpful. If you look, for example, there are several examples of this tile right there. This is a steel cable. This is what the uh, cable looked like when they left the factory in Trenton. So they were quite, they were immensely heavy, so you can only carry one, one or two on each railroad car. And you'll see this is basically a picture. That's basically a picture of that image. Because you know the Roman company had to give these images to Batchelder here in Pasadena to produce the tiles. The next shot is anybody want to call this walk over here? And then I'll come back. Now this confused me a little bit until I got a hold of it. This looks like a little house. This is 1848. So it confused me at first. I thought this was a representation of like maybe his first home, you know, in Zoxenberg or something. This is the factory. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Trenton factory. This is the first the factory in Trenton in 1848. And, and this is that, you do not have a picture of this. This is his nephew's hand done drawing that he did not pull it for a high school. And there's a picture. So there's. So this this drawing, I mean, a copy of drawing would have been sent to his bachelor's in Pasadena. So this is the forty is the first the first um, factory in. Um, so by this point, if you look at the background, this man has got a got a fantastic engineer. Expert in bridge building, road building, architecture, everything you mentioned. Now he's like cornering the market and has the patent on, on wire, uh, wire rope. And uh, he needs to say the Brooklyn Bridge is not become the first suspension bridge in the uh, world. You've got to show what you can do. So he was building, he started building all kinds of different sizes of walkways and bridges all across the United States. A lot of work was going on before the Civil War. Uh, and he was working on the Cincinnati to Covington Bridge, um, which is a very beautiful, very Victorian uh, bridge before the Civil War. And they had stopped work on that. He finished it after, um, after the Civil War. And that's really when he said, look what I can do. You know, this, I can stand the Ohio River. If I can stand the Ohio River, I can do anything. And he finds to get the commission for the Brooklyn, you know, for the Brooklyn Bridge. So, uh, so off they go. And he's got a tremendous reputation at this point. And uh, they start to work on the bridge. And here we begin some of the sort of amazing ironies and uh, amazing things about a family which is really outstanding but also had a very painful, uh, had a very painful history. Uh, Johan uh, August, John, John A. John A. Robinson, and the size of him, never built the Brooklyn Bridge. He was among them as a surveyor. So he was down <clears throat> on the docks, surveying for the location. There's nothing there. He's surveying. He had the design. He the design, he knew what he wanted to do. Uh, he's got the wire rope, he's got everything he needs. He's got the commission, and he was standing on the edge of the dock with one foot, kind of somehow got down here when he was looking through his surveying, you know, uh, field finder there, and I guess was very absorbed with what he was doing when a ferry came in and smashed his foot and crushed it. Well, because he was a utopianist type person, he didn't want to believe in modern medicine. They wanted to manage the foot, which were the same thing. And he refused. So naturally, he was to pour water over the foot 24 hours a day, which didn't do anything. So tetanus set in, and he died about 10 days later when he was 63. So here is his family and the business of the wire rope and the commission to build the greatest bridge in the world, and John Rogan, John August is dead. His son was Washington, his oldest son was Washington Rogan. And uh, he was 32, and he was trained as an engineer very formally. He helped build the Covington Kentucky Bridge, and obviously he was a very close partner with his fathers. He understood everything, he knew how to do it. Obviously, he owns the, the family of the wire rope business. And just as a little aside, because this really kind of blew me away in terms of historical connections, um, a few of us might have heard of a little place called Gettysburg. As General Lee was approaching Gettysburg on the first day to take up his positions, General Lee's forces were trying to decide what they were going to do to receive him. Major Washington Rowan, aide de camp to uh, General uh, Rose, Rose Manor, I can't pronounce it, Rose Manor, looked up at Little Round Top, which was to be 
become the left flank of the Union defense. There was nobody there. And the one thing that all the Union commanders understood was if they were going to fight a defensive battle was they had to keep the high ground. They could hold the high ground, fire down on the Confederates, put their artillery up there. That was the most important thing they could do. So here's the Washington Roman, John Roman's oldest son, who volunteered to command the New York artillery battery throughout the war, climbs to the top, a little round top, looks around and says, holy God, this is going to be the left flank. And if anybody turns the left flank, we're done. You know, they'll just roll us, Lee will just roll us right up. He comes rushing down the hill, takes his own artillery battery, leading it himself, physically drags his artillery battery to the top of the little round top, goes back to the general who he serves under, and says, I got the artillery up there, we must have infantry. You know, the artillery must be protected by infantry. Round top would not have been protected if Roman hadn't done this. The general gets troops up there, so you've got artillery, you've got troops. Roman looks around and takes it in his own initiative. Decides this is these aren't enough troops. He, but he's got enough men there now to do something. He goes off and gets reinforcements from some other New York brigade that surrenders like a company or two companies of men, something like that. Roman personally leads them back to the little round top right at the moment when the Confederate Army is coming in, breaking the line of the left flank. He arrives with reinforcements, which he brought himself and then throw them back. So a little round top had been uh, defeated and thrown back into the Civil War. He probably would have lost. Um, the battle of Gettysburg. That's just one day. It's the two days in the life of Washington and Rome. Uh, <laughs> I was going to do that when I did the Battle of Vienna, but I figured you know what happens if I get. Maybe after we're done, people get. I can do a really short. What I was going to do about eight, when, when Johann was in, in Prussia, there really is an interesting span of years. He's born in 1806 when the Prussian army was defeated at Vienna, but he goes to the Berlin Academy in 1815 when the French army under Napoleon is defeated, not by the English, <laughs> but by the Prussian army commanded by Field Marshal uh, Blucher. Uh, so he, his, so the, the years of his adolescence, you know, when he's born, and it goes, is perfectly matched with the defeat and then the victory of the Prussian army at, uh, at Waterloo. So very tumultuous. I mean, think, you know, think about the era in which he grew up in you know, those years, you know, from his birth year to, to 15 years old, he's in a country occupied by a foreign, you know, foreign power and really under their uh, subjugation. So it was it, it was sort of interesting um, coalescing those uh, years in the So the Civil War is over and Washington rushes back to the company business. They build the Cincinnati Bridge, they get the commission from Brooklyn, uh, Johan is dead. Uh, Washington at the age of 32 takes over and he starts to build what they call the King Science. I read the suspension bridge, the strength of the suspension bridge by the ends, all those cables, tons and tons and tons of cables are going to go down inside the earth in huge caissons, pits, in which they are attached to, you know, filled with concrete and whatever, you know, they've got to be affixed. This is where the strength is. The post that you see in the middle just sort of distributed, all that is just to distribute weight through the cable. These caissons, nobody ever, I don't remember how deep they were, but they were very, very deep, and very few people had this experience uh, before. And this is where we first sort of discover what we now call the bend, because people didn't understand it. They were very, very deep. You know, I can't remember the relationship was like oxygen, and nitrous, nitrous, and whatever was building up in your in your muscle when it was sort of killing you. And they didn't, they didn't understand about that. This is where we first discovered it. Fire broke out in the first case on, and the Romans did not leave from behind. The Romans were left from the front. And especially given what they had done in the Civil War, he was not something who was going to hold back. He uh, grabbed uh, you know, the buckets of water or whatever, whatever it was they had. So Washington Roman personally led the workers back into the King's Island, where it was full of fire and smoke and stench and fought the fire for a very long time. But you can't stay that deep for that long, number one, plus they're breathing smoke and fire on top of everything. So he came out of suffering from what they call King's Island disease or the bands which afflicted him for the rest of his life. He never, he never recovered. But he would not give up. This was a family commission, and he had the knowledge it was his father's dream. He got a second or third floor apartment in the building on the harbor that overlooked where the Brooklyn Bridge would, would become. He was beggared. He could not function. He could not physically go to the site. He never went to the site again. So all he ever saw was the first king sign being built on the day that it caught on fire. So he started to work. And he knew what he wanted to do. This is his wife, Emily Warren Roby. This is actually Royal Union before the coronation was signed. It was the second 
1896 in um, St. Petersburg. She had a regular education, but not a formal education. For 11 years, for 11 years, she sat by his bedside and took dictation of the highest orders of mathematics and physics and every, you know, and uh, stress, you know, stress reductions and whatever you can imagine for 11 years. She went to the site and gave all orders to build the Brooklyn Bridge. So without Emily, you know, without him laying in not not a deathbed, but I mean, he was better. Uh, in his in his in his home with Emily transferring, she had to go to college. She had to study these these topics. She had to be able to go down to the bridge and talk to men about these things every single day. And there's no question without her, the Brooklyn Bridge would not have been uh, would not have been finished. President Chester Arthur uh, was at the opening of the bridge, but Emily got Emily was the first to walk across. Um, Washington never came to the bridge. The president went to his apartment later in the day to shake hands with him and uh, Washington ordered a very nice dinner. He had a bank for his senior managers, you know, for his family, but he never went to the bridge again. And uh, apparently enough, he lived until 1926, he was 89 years old. Um, but with all that money, you can imagine how immensely wealthy this family was because of this business, because of the world of business, you know. But uh, there was nothing to do for him after he was, he was that bad. He, he remarried. Emily unfortunately died of stomach cancer in 1903. So she did that, that Well, she lived, well, it's been a few years, Brooklyn Bridge is 1883. So she certainly did live some years, but, but sad to say, they were obviously, you cannot imagine how close, you know, with, uh, that Emily and, and Washington were. And another quick sideline is that uh, his son, his only son, died on board the Titanic in 1912. Oh. <laughs> so a little bad Stay away from water. <laughs> There's so, I mean, it was really, it's hard not to go off too much when we start this. This is one of the more recent, this is called the Working Legacy. We get this off at a different zinc, I've been in touch with him. He's been very helpful. This is wonderful because it's a great picture book. Wonderful, wonderful archival pictures. All the way back to the Kingdom of Prussia and the little, the little house, the little tobacco shop that Wilhelm's father uh, owned. There's another wonderful book called The Great Bridge. Ken Burns in the documentary based on The Great Bridge. Uh, nice pictures, but tremendous amount of information. But you know, in terms of you know, the pictures, sort of say a thousand words. And uh, this, I have a both. And this is just a wonderful, wonderful book as far as this topic is concerned. That's something I would definitely, well, I'd recommend you know, but this is great as far as the pictures are concerned. Uh, various, uh, Johan had nine children. So one way or the other, somebody tried to keep the business afloat. And uh, when you leave here today, one really important point, because I think it's a very touching point. You leave here today and walk out into the parking lot here, turn around and look, and look back at the loading dock. If you didn't already notice, look above the loading dock, across the full length of the building, and it says, John A. Roblin's Sons Company. It does not say John A. Roblin's and Sons Company, because we already told when it was back. We had techniques, we knew there was a point at which he wasn't going to make it. I mean, it was, you know, the wrong decision, it was too late. And he's on the wheel. He made a really, really big point. That was the name he wanted for a company. So his name would survive, but it would be his son's company because he would have gone. And he knew he would have gone. So when you walk out there, take a look at that name, and that's why that name says what it is. It's not said Roman and Sons, it's Roman's sons. I think the title of the verse is Yeah, there yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so at any rate, uh, people, for a while, people stopped, stopped dying, which was good. <laughs> and they uh, all of the, you know, wound up building this huge, huge factory, uh, one of those great city complexes. They took care of their workers, and it was a utopian ideal that he had brought from Hegel and from uh, Prussia continued on. And it was one of those cities, but it was a very good city in Germany, where the city, where they, the, the workers, they lived there, they had hospitals, you know, they had all the medical attention they wanted to, they had. But I don't mean in terms of being abused, their employees were very proud to, uh, to work for the Roman company. And, uh, and they held the, uh, the patent and sort, and, and sort of part of the market on this for a long time. In the early 1900s, they acquired a contract with, uh, I think, an electrical uh, uh, company to provide the cable to bring the uh, power poles from, uh, I think it says, Kern, Kern County to Los Angeles. And, and when they brought power here, they doubled uh, the, the project, doubled the amount of electric power in Los Angeles at that time. That was made possible by the wire rope that went on those 
telephone poles. So at that point, they needed a dist distribution center. So this was never a factory. Everything was always made in Trenton. There was never any other factory than this huge complex in Trenton. But they had 15 or 16 distribution centers across the United States. And when they got the contract here, they built, they built this. Um, one of the interesting things is above, that was a water fountain over there in the corner, which is next to a water fountain. The bowl was missing. I'm going to guess that there was water damage at one point because you can see damage to the tile, and the bowl probably disintegrated and just, they just took it out of the But um, what was interesting is that if you read the commemoration plaque above it, it says this tile is a gift from the employees of the Johnny Williams company. And up below that, it says of California. Because when they got the contract here, they had to incorporate the former corporation of California. So it's the track company, obviously, you know, is the sort of uh, overseer of the parent company. But that's one reason it says of California, because they had to incorporate here when they got this, uh, when they got this uh, contract. Um, and again, all the tile here, which I already mentioned, this would have been pretty amazing. Ernst Batchelder started making tile in his backyard in 1910, 1912. In 1912, the neighbors told him you better shut down the kills because you know, smoke and dirt and soot was running over top of everybody, top of roofs. So 1912, he started his own pottery, a small pottery in Pasadena, but an actual business. So this was a very early, this, this is close to the chocolate shop, a very, very early commission, all custom work. None of these tiles appear in the catalog and the expense, which means, now he had a modeler, and obviously he had a, this would have been the same modeler that did the chocolate shop, I'm sure, at the same time period. You know, you can certainly see it's the same, same artist, you know. So he had a modeler on staff, so he's got everything he needs. But when you make a mold, you can then make thousands and thousands of tiles. So the cost effectiveness of that mold is tremendous. This is not the case. There's some pieces here you see one or two of these examples of these tiles. And if they were not shipped out to any other um, uh, location, then this is the only place they were used. So this would have been a very, very expensive uh, endeavor to learn that other and to Get the designs from Rome and the pictures from Rome and then have all this design and, and set up. So all these tiles, except for the, the tiles around, what was the uh, drinking fountain? Those are standard, the peacocks, the double peacocks, and the four by fours. They come out of the catalog. But all the rest of this, which you can see, which represents all the uses of uh, steel wire uh, cable, custom made, just for this room. We have the JDR and the of the room. And when you go outside, you take a look outside, way up almost to the roof line, there are um, pieces of, I believe, terracotta uh, that, have, that have the same initials. And uh, Bachelor, Bachelor could have easily, once you get one mold for those, you could be as many as you want to. So they're probably the same. They're also probably the same. Uh, what year was this built? 13, 1913. So and was it built by the Romans for the Bachelor's Yeah, they built, right, they built the building. They, they built the building. Brian, I'm wondering, just um, this pause, so we've got on the floor this porcelain tile. Yeah, I'm very sure. much. I'm wondering if you can just, because you live in Rufus Keeler's house, if you can just give us this overview. You've got this porcelain tile on the ground that's very much an East Coast phenomenon, very old fashioned. You've got this beautiful Michelin tile, which is, which is not a glaze, but really important to Southern California ceramic design in this room, but it's not the way. And then you live in Lucas Keeler's house, whose quest in his life was to perfect an orange. Well, red. Was red, the red. 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 I know we're not looking at any of Keeler's style, but you just want to give us this, this arc of color and design in Southern California ceramic tile design, just from, from this, this porcelain floor to the cheller to Keeler's work to find the perfect red culminates in the 1920s, these beautiful reds and oranges, which are Spanish colonial revival, which really define what Southern California design is in that time. Well, how the tile is made gets into a whole other area, so I'll be rather simple just because we have some examples here. The floor, if you stop to think about it, like most bathroom floors and kitchen floors from uh, this era look like they're normally hexagons or octagons. But when you look down at it, this is not the kind of tile Rolling up on, on the wall. This is actually more of a form of porcelain. Porcelain has a very hard, high contact of kale and clay, which is what you see in very fine porcelain. The kale makes it very fine and very, very, very dense. 
This is not glaze. Whatever color you're looking at here, the golden, this golden yellow or the white or the red or whatever it is, the entire, these are not thick. These little tiles are not, not thick. They're only about this, about this thick. But they are so strong, and kale and clay makes them so strong that they're more of a form of, of, uh, of porcelain, which in a sense is more like what your kitchen sink and your bathtub are made out of is, is uh, a form of porcelain. And all I can say is, as small as you can walk on these for like the next 10 million years, and you will not wear these down. And the color will never disappear because the color is solid. You know, you have a glaze tile, your color's on the top, usually. And then you get the bisque tile, you know, underneath. So this is more of a personal, this is sort of a Victorian, you know, we see late Victorian subway style uh, tile and bathrooms, things like that. This is more of a carryover over that, but very practical for a floor. This is very, very appropriate. Um, the tile Mr. Keeler made is called in Gobe. Uh, the Gobe tile is the bisque tile, it's not glazed. Mr. Richelder. Who did I say? Keeler. I'm wrong. <laughs> Uh, the Romans have gotten so confused because there's so much to do. So, okay, so Batchelder, that's right. I think that Richard's here. So Batchelder made a Gobi tile, which made this tile, which is not glazed. So this is a one-fire process. You take your you take your mold and you get your tile with the image in it. What's called the greenware, and it's still wet. And all they did for color was take a, a clay slip called the clay slip that were just barrels around one end of the kiln with different, very, very thin, very watery clay. And then you would brush, you would take that, brush it across the surface, take a rag, rub the surface color away so that the color that you wanted, in this case the baby blue, winds up in the recesses but not on the surface. So this is appropriate for what was going on in 1913, which was more the mission style and the arts and crafts um, designs and houses and buildings we had at that time. After World War I, we started getting uh, a tremendous explosion of uh, Spanish colonial des uh, designs, and obviously the entire difference was. And, the type of tile was made. Now you have very richly glazed, very highly glazed, but very, very colorful tile based on you know Spain and the Moors and the Persians and you know and on and on and on. So styles start to, start to change, and that's one reason Mr. Keeler and Mr. Batchelder can compete kind of equally is because it's just a matter of what you want. It's a matter of architecture, you know. So between between them, then is this, uh, you know great difference in the designs and the type of tiles that are that are being made. So they both went out of business in 1930 and 1934. Um, Brian, a question over here? Yeah. In, right in front of the bar, there's a beautiful directional legend in the floor. Can you, can you tell us? I haven't have seen that. It's what You know what I'm talking I'll about? Have to you know the decap? Yeah. We, we edited that. Oh, you edited it. Yeah, there's no relationship with anything. Really? Oh. It was taken by the designer took the imagery from historical imagery that was made for that style. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. A question, the tile, you said they have to make a mold. Those aren't carved then? No, these are not hand carved. Okay. These, are, these are, I would say they're made for a mold. The, the, the Dutch chocolate shop, the custom murals are all hand modeled, hand sculpted by a model. Yeah, at least there's a few cases, there's two or three of each tile, which would indicate they're, to me they're made from a, from a mold. Yeah. Did the Roebling people show an equal interest in architecture and in decor in their other factories or their other distribution centers? That's what I'm trying to, to find out, which is the museum. Like I say, their museum didn't, wasn't even aware of this, this lobby until about a week ago. So, yeah. They knew about the building. They knew about the building. They didn't know, didn't know about the tile. They didn't, they didn't know about what this looks like. You know? So that's why I was man who wrote this book. I sent all the pictures to man who wrote the book. So I want to send people to uh, the thing is with the tile. I mean, this much tile should be a couple of boxes. You know, they could have sent this. Matter of fact, one one thing I asked them, the author was, "Are you in touch with any of the Roman family? Do they own their homes? Can you imagine they own the most beautiful mansions in Trenton, New Jersey? You know, because they could have incorporated this tile into their homes. You know, the, there's, there's none at the museum. There's no tiles at the museum. They were never aware of." So we're trying to find out, because that was my question, once you've created the walls, you can make as many of these tiles as you want. Um, and just a couple other connections. There's something called the Vincent Thomas Bridge. Oh, yeah. Anybody ever heard of the Golden Gate? Yeah. <laughs> Roman, Roman Cable. The Golden Gate is all Roman Cable in New Jersey. And uh, this is a quick little picture here because it's, uh, it's funny, it's one of the first things I thought of what they could use the cable for, but think about aircraft. I 
at that time. How do you control your, your flying surfaces? Charles Lindbergh. Mm. Rolling cables were on the spirit of St. Louis and did all that for him personally. And then, this is great because Johan was, um, and he was an engineer engineer. He was not a nautical engineer. And I come across the monitor. That's not the monitor. Johann Robin submitted his own design for the monitor to defeat the Mariners. <laughs> he was not even an article engineer. The, the, the monitor being a submersible monitor. Two guys, two guys, the, 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 the Mariner, the monitor of the Mariner. Now they did not accept this because Ericsson, the Swedish guy, he was an article engineer and he also made the guns. They were called Dolphin guns. So they took the design from Ericsson and the Swedish and not from Robin. But the fact that I mean, the fact that he's got the brains, yeah. you know, yeah. to create this and submit it to the War Department and say, hey, maybe I can help. You know, it's just, I think it's just amazing. Um, the company continued on, generally very successful in St. Louis for many, many years. In the early 50s, they had reached a point where most of their steel mills and the equipment and the original 80 ton, you know, twist wire machine that one of his sons designed after he died. He's all sitting there in the trim. So it's great stuff. It's really old. And it's really inefficient. And you can imagine what a hazardous waste site the plant had become by that point. So they were purchased by another company which kept the Roman name. And they went on for quite a few years. And then in the 70s, they sold out to somebody else. And at some point, kind of needless to say, the whole thing was condemned because of the, the contamination on the site. It was just you know, an old steel mill like that. Terrible, you know, there's been no protection of any kind since um, the, well, the late, late 1800s when they, when they built the thing. So, um, at any rate, uh, almost all of that is gone, but the great big building that the workers pass in and out every single day to get their checks and to clock in and do all that, that is still there and is a museum. And uh, Washington uh, built, Washington uh, uh, built a city called Roman outside of Trenton. So, in Roman, the city of Roman is. And um, so what the, the family's doing with all that right now, I don't you know, quite know. But uh, anyhow, that's just, you know, as long as that took, that's sort of like the, that's the tip of the iceberg of what the Roman family did and what we started, we started in 1806 and then we were pushing. Um, and then our wonderful connection with the uh, Prince of So, Brian, I was wondering, supposedly, you come to a site, you're a tile guy, we call you, we show you a you've never seen it. Shelter, maybe it's a Palco, Hebrews company, maybe it's a Malibu the pottery company, Kilo or Go on the this year, What do you do when Tim and I call you and you come to a site and you're just not sure what you're looking at? Just I think I think people might find this thing so Well, so, so you're, you're, you're incredibly talented, you've seen everything up. All the catalogs of all these ceramic factories are in stacks in your office. You've done an encyclopedic photographic memory. So what do you what was your name again, sir? Seems like we've met somewhere. I still remember several several calls. Well, I'm kind of fortunate in a general sense now after 26 years of doing that. And this is not what I started out to do. I started out because of my interest in Rufus. But obviously when you get a call to come and identify, everybody thinks they've got Malibu Todd. That's one of the first things. Oh, yeah, Malibu Todd. I love it. I love it. But you don't realize that there's several dozen fabulous tile makers from most of Southern California, but also in Northern California through that period. Um, I mean, just for example, Bashelt is sort of a shot of this. Like, for example, in Gobi Tile, Gobi is just a process, that's all. Anybody could have made a Gobi Tile. Uh, several companies made a Gobi Tile. You know, Bashelt did not necessarily corner the market. He was the most famous. Playcraft is a company that had a very extensive Gobi line and a glazed line, both. Because after World War I, they saw there was money to do both, so why should we? You know, limit ourselves. Uh, a company by the name of Mures is another one that did in Gobi Tile. So I guess one of the first things is, after this many years, a lot of times I will see something I'll recognize you know, immediately. But after that, then you start looking at, obviously, what do you got? Do you have a Gobi Tile? Do you have a high gloss tile? What's the design? Uh, how is it made? Is it quite a safe? Is it, is it quaint? Is it um, um, any number of other, you know, And things. where does that have means? Dry line. Dry line is the way to apply the The glaze, yeah. The Quaker needs tough, tough or basin, which means the image. In a way, this is Quaker time, because the image right. still is embossed into 
the surface. It's not quite what I need to stretch the definition a little bit. This is still kind of like a tile because you're using the depressions to cover the bases in a slightly different, slightly different way. But I think you can still call it that. But the fact that it's in just means it's not laid. So, um, you know, and then obviously from there you go into like looking at ancient Maya or a friend just, you know, two nights ago because I get emails all the time. A friend in Long Beach sent a, uh, you know, an emergency email about an ancient Maya fireplace on Ocean Avenue in Long Beach. She wanted this house for sale. She wasn't going to go see the show. Well, incredibly enough, like 15 years ago I was already down there by, the, by another realtor that asked me to come down. And uh, of all things, it was Blaze Bachelor. A little, bit, a little bit of glazed tile later, and it's like, you didn't do a lot. But after 1920, he, he fired the ceramics. He had to hire ceramics to do this, yeah. Because he himself had no knowledge of, uh, it's just not what he made, you know, a bash already had no background in ceramic glazes. Because that's not what this is. So, um, his name I turned to later. After 1920, he expanded in 1920, and he saw that the market of Spanish colonial and Mountain in Calico were grabbing the market, you know. So he understood that they were still making uh, more just Spanish and very beautiful tile like that. So Ivan, Ivan Bram, Ivan Bram was a ceramist from uh, the Department of Ceramic Engineering at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And he hired him to come here and make glazes. Uh, <clears throat> so he did get into that, but you know, you know, somehow, at least from what I've seen, somehow they never quite caught on that line of things. Always, always known for this. He's always known for the Ingove, for the Ingove time. So, and beyond that, once I started to have all that, then I, then I had my list of catalogs, my own just photo albums of years and years and years of taking pictures. And then there's a national organization called the Tile Heritage Foundation. And I really didn't stop to write before, I just want to confirm what I'm thinking, you know, I said, to them. And Dr. Winter was feeling better with contacting them directly. Uh, Bob, Bob Winter. Bob Winter. A little while. Um, and then what happens is when you're in the tile community, um, all of us who've done this for all these years, it is fun. Every, we just do this. If you're a collector or you're a historian, you find areas for whatever reason you just love this area. You like this tile, you like this person, you like something. So one of the things that we all have amongst each other is uh, sort of, a, like I say, sort of a small community. Um, so we, you know, we all get a kick out of each other, but we're all fanatics and slightly different ways. Like I had one friend, a friend named Catalina. She's, you know, she's having the tile, that's it, she's written a book, she, and she keeps a home out there. She lives in San Francisco. Comes down here just to be close to where the pottery was. <laughs> <laughs> and, stuff like that. and then there was Dr. Winter, who spent his life studying Bad And then I have another it's friend. In, I have a friend in uh, uh, Oakland who's a tile center. And I don't mean, I mean, Mirror, I mean, when our country bathrooms and kitchens and I mean, murals from the past, Simon and Maria, just a brilliant, I mean, a really artistic, artistic tile center. Solon and Shovel, SNS, was a wonderful company up in the San Francisco area. So, for him, it was local, you know, so he has a reason, you know, he has a connection to that. So, at any rate, he goes straight for SNS. And I went to go to a tile convention up there one time, and I stayed over at his, his, his house, you know. And I, I hadn't even thought for a second what his house would look like, you know, I could never even just imagine. <laughs> I walk into the living room, which is cute little Spanish colonial, very simple little Spanish colonial bungalow. There's no furniture, no furniture, like a sweeping bag in front of a <laughs> half big fireplace that's like falling apart. And one of the pegboards, floor to ceiling pegboards, all around his living room, solid and shovel tile, you know, being held by little wire hooks. Floor to ceiling, floor <laughs> to ceiling. <laughs> And a holy Oh, really? What a lovely, lovely home you have. And, uh, and of course, I mean, at least it goes to the store, but at least we understand each other, you know? So what happens? Like three days, I get, oh, this one was clean, uh, 1823, and June, I think, and this was going to He goes through this whole thing, I got, you know, man, you're so blown away by that. So anyway, we all have our things. So what happens is we really think you're in an area that the style is right, the things is right, then I would say, you know, if any one of those people, and I'll say, what have I got here? And, and you know what, if they don't know, they will very often say, call Kirby in San Jose or whatever, and then figure it out. But the, the, German, the German tile of Long Beach was the greatest coup d'etat, which had nothing to do with the United States at all. But 
I don't know if we're allowed to be allowed to talk about that. No. You're not. Brian? Can you get Brian? To see me now? Well, what is it that the closer you get to the tile, you have a phrase? See, the closer you get to the antique tile, the more crazy you get? Or? Yes, that's the phrase. It doesn't impact you. But I'm a new. I'm a new. We're starting to get the new guys. <laughs> It's all those toxic materials inside the place. <laughs> they start getting into your, you start getting into your head. So I think, um, I think if there are some questions, definitely let's ask. So if you have to go, we've got a center waiting for you. We've got other things to do. Please, you want another beer? Go get it. But mind, you're going to be here to answer questions. Yeah, I'll be here. I'll be stay here. Formally, please formally excuse me. You're going to be right here. Yeah. I just have a main training question. What in this building is original and what isn't? I like is this hallway, this is pretty much it. I think this is our lobby. The entire lobby is original. What about the bathrooms? I mean, what else is nothing not at all? Good job. The sliders? Yeah. Or the schools. Yeah. Schools are coming to the big slide and schools will come back. And this is so this was active as their their. Oh yeah, this was still active then. Till here I remember. Mr. Hanks sent me something the other day. It's really great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Here is that. This is 1947, and this is a page out of Roman handbook, as it were. So 1947, this warehouse site was still active. Here's a list of all of their distributions in the United States. And then, because you can imagine, they were big exporters. You know, this, 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 this steel wire came all over the world. So then there's an export address for what left the United States from New Jersey. And after they built, after they built the uh, factory, the, uh, they became so world famous because the car from Mexico uh, a motto for the city says, what Trenton makes, the world takes. Oh, wow. That really came from Roman. The motto actually came from Roman's manufacturing. Uh, uh, the sign, uh, it's the bridge. Uh, you see it where you're going up. There's a sign that says that when you're going in from Pennsylvania. Uh, oh, really? 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 I love your podcast. I'm enjoying it. Something you can look at. Yeah. 